series along with the new year, and uh, I, we're, we're going to be tackling one of those questions, and by one of those questions I mean like the big question, the, the question that kind of it keeps us awake at night sometimes, it's that it, it's one of those questions that we wrestle with a lot, it's one of the biggest questions you can ask in life, what is God's will for my life, what is God's plan for my life, what does God have for me, we've heard of, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, that famous verse that everybody likes about, for I know the plans I have, you says the Lord, plans for you to prosper, not to harm you, plans to take care of you, things like that. But what does that look like? So we're going to take a look at that this time. And there's something about, there's something about starting a new year that kind of feels fitting to take a look at it, because there's so much potential in the year in front of us. We have so much time to kind of really let it settle in and to try and figure out what's going to be next for us. I mean, our calendars have reset. For many of us, we have, you know, like the health, the health insurance things kind of kick over starting in December, January. Your vacation days may very well be back. All sorts of things kind of turn over. We're at that point now where everybody is making their goals, their resolutions. They're taking a look at what they want out of 2015. And for some of us, that can be really exciting. It can be really exciting to think we have, you know, 361 days to make the most out of our next year, to make the most out of what this, this year could be or what our life could be. We have no idea what this year holds for us. And for others, that's really intimidating, right? To think that you have an entire year to make decisions that may or may not have lasting impact on our lives, that can be a bit much. Just the idea of challenging or changing things in our life can send some of us into a mild panic attack. Because after all, we've worked really hard to get stable and secure in our life. And so now, the idea of something in this year changing that, or challenging that, that's risky. And that's frightening for us. And I think for many of us, we find ourselves in that kind of a situation because we have settled into a rhythm. We have settled into a life that we kind of just accept. Maybe this is just the young, idyllic nature that I have, but I think for a lot of people, we kind of hit a point where we say, this isn't exactly what I wanted, but it's good enough, right? This isn't what I had planned for my life, but I'm here, I'm comfortable, I'm safe, I'm secure, I'm okay with it. It's just easier this way. It might not be what I had hoped for, but it's what I have. It is what it is. That famous phrase. As a side note, I really don't like that phrase because I hear a lot of resignation from it. I just hear a lot of people like, eh, I don't care enough to fight it. And maybe it's because of my time in, in, in hospice and palliative care chaplaincy, I heard a lot of people there just kind of give up with that phrase of it is what it is. And so that's why I really don't like it. Because when we start talking about new years and we say, well, the year is what it is, that's the way life goes. That's why I'm not a really big fan of it. And here's the thing, I don't even know what it is for you. For all the time that I've been talking so far, you might be thinking I'm talking about your job or your career. You might be thinking you want more out of your professional life. Maybe you're thinking I'm talking about your spiritual life. Maybe you think I'm talking about your, your relationship with God, and you want more out of that, but you're not, you don't have the time for that. You don't have the know-how, you don't have the ability to delve deeper with that. Or maybe you think I'm talking about your family life. You want a better marriage. You want a better relationship with your kids. I don't know what it is for you. But all of us have those moments in our life. Whatever it may be, we all have times in our life where we want more out of it. We feel like something is missing. We feel like there is a hole or a void in the thing that we hold up as our meaning, as our purpose, as our vision for life. And that hole, that void, is going to cause us to ask one question. And it's going to cause us to ask that question in many different ways. But it's going to cause us to ask, is this it? Is this the life that we're supposed to have? Is this what God has planned for us? Is this it? This is all that God has for us. That abundant life that Christ tells us about in the Gospel of John. This is it? I mean, does this feel like abundant life to you? How would you even know what that looks like? How do you know what abundant life feels like? What does that look like for you? And more importantly, what does abundant life feel like 
for you? What does it look like when you are living as close to God as possible and fully alive, passionately alive in something? Is it a hobby? Is it your family? Is it your career? Is it something else entirely? These are the questions that come up when we start talking about what we want to do in the new year and who we want to be. And more importantly, who God wants us to be. What is it that makes us feel most alive and closest to God? And these are the questions. That last one in particular, frighten us. What are our dreams? What are our hopes for our life? That's the question that keeps us awake at night and frightens us. And it frightens us for a couple of different reasons. We get scared about asking our, what our dreams are, what our goals are, because our dreams can sometimes be so perfect in our head that we're scared of ruining them. We know we can't achieve them. We know we can't accomplish them. So I don't want to touch it. I just want to leave it there. And so maybe we're scared of getting into a relationship because it will never be as good as I want it to be. Maybe we're scared of getting into a, a, a career field because I'll never be as good at it as I want to be. Maybe we're scared of getting deeper with God because I'll never be as good at it as I want to be or as someone else. Or maybe we're, we're scared that we'll ruin it. It's not even that we won't be able to accomplish it. We'll break it. We'll ruin it somehow. And so we just, we won't even try. Because it's just, it's easier that way. We have too much going on in life to go after these things. But I want to challenge you to think back to when you were a kid. And how you dreamed when you were a kid. The goals that you had. The, the careers and the jobs that you wanted to have. The things that you wanted to do when you were a kid. I had hundreds of things I wanted to do when I was younger. I think I told you a few weeks or months ago that one of the jobs I wanted to have, and I don't know how this was going to work, I have no idea how this would ever get me money, but I wanted to be an astronaut, firefighter, cowboy, all at the same time. Now, I mean, I was six, so I don't feel as bad about that, but, you know, how does that even work? But when you're six, you can dream like that, you can think like that. As I've gotten older, I've stepped away from wanting to be this, this hybrid firefighter astronaut to, you know, some more tangible things that are still lofty goals. In high school and college, I thought how fun it would be to write books. As I got older, I thought about running ultra marathons or jumping out of airplanes with the Army. I've had all kinds of goals throughout my life. Even just recently, I've taken up woodworking. I still have all my fingers, by the way, so, hey, so far so good. But I'm just now getting into it at 30. And that's a goal. That's something I've wanted to do for years. I just haven't taken the time to get started with it. And I've had different reasons. Cost, time, know-how. But really, it was the know-how that stopped me. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't want to feel like an idiot getting started. So I didn't want to get started. Until one day, I just... Got the advice that sometimes you just have to start and make mistakes and start again, and keep making mistakes, and eventually you'll figure that part out. I don't know what your goals were. Maybe you want to be your own business owner and be entirely self-sufficient. Maybe you want to set your own schedule and be able to live financially independent of somebody else. Maybe you dreamt of being that perfect parent or spouse. Or maybe you wanted to be a pilot when you were growing up and you still kind of want to, or maybe you want to have a certain amount of acres so that you can have your own farm, or maybe you want to be an actor or an actress, whatever it is. We all have those kind of goals that are really personal and intimate to us. Goals that no one else has ever heard of. Dreams and hopes and things that we want to do in our life that no one knows about because we, we haven't shared them with each other. And we haven't shared them because life gets in the way. It's easy to dream when you're a kid. It's easy to talk about all the things you want to do when you're younger. But as you get older, life has a way of piling up on us. As you get older, you start to have these responsibilities, these families, these jobs, these other things that pop up. And suddenly the world gets a little bit more fuzzy. Our vision starts to get a little bit more blurry as we get older. I haven't had my glasses that long. You might remember when it, like, it just happened in September. But I can tell you, I knew I needed them a while ago. Like at the beginning of 2014, I could start to tell my vision was going. But it happened so subtly that I didn't realize how bad it was 
until I actually went to the eye doctor. At first, it was just having a difficulty reading street signs from, from further away, like I had been able to, and eventually driving at night got to be a problem because the headlights were really fuzzy and blurry and brighter than they should have been, and I was really wondering why everybody had their brights on when I was out. I started to get headaches, and that was kind of the moment I was like, maybe I should go see an optometrist. The same thing happens spiritually for us. Gradually, we can lose sight of everything going on around us that God is doing. Gradually, we lose sight of the ways in which God is working in our lives. Gradually, our spiritual vision gets blurry. We can get so bogged down with our family, our jobs, our relationships, and all these other things that pull our attention away that the idea of what God has in mind for us, the vision that God has for us, it gets smaller and smaller, blurrier and blurrier. Because we don't see how it could be possible in the face of everything else that we have. Or maybe, maybe something happens in our life and it isn't that gradual for us. Maybe we had these dreams and we tried to live them out, but something happened. And they got broke. They got ruined. Just like we were afraid they would. And this can happen in a number of different ways. Some of us might have hoped to have a big family when we were growing up. You're ready, you're ready for six, seven, eight kids. I see some people really panicking at that number. <laughs> but some people want to have a big family, and then they have their first child. And they're born with severe disabilities that make it really difficult for you to think about having any more because of how much time, energy, money, and investment the first one is taking. And suddenly your dream changes. Or maybe, maybe, you had wanted to pursue acting, or athletics, or a certain career. And then you got hurt. And you spent time recovering from an injury or an illness that stopped you from being able to do that. Maybe there was a financial setback that meant you couldn't go to school the way you had hoped and get the training that you needed for the job that you wanted. Maybe you're still digging out of that financial hole. And so all the dreams that you had have been put on hold indefinitely. Life has a way of clouding our vision, whether it is suddenly or gradually. And so for some of us, when we hear people talk about all that God has in mind for us, when we talk about, or when we hear people talk about God's plan or God's vision for our life, we're kind of left thinking that's got to be for somebody else. They cannot possibly be talking about me. Or maybe, maybe when they're talking about Jesus and that abundant life he's offering, they're talking only about heaven. But it certainly isn't now, because take a look at the way my life is. It's not now, it's got to be then. It certainly isn't for us. Maybe for somebody else, maybe it's for later, but it's not now and it's not us. Life has a way of blinding us to God's vision. And today I want to share a story out of the Gospel that I think will help show us how to see with God's eyes again. Uh, the, the story is going to be, I'm going to say it's a story about a man named Josh, because as some of you have caught on, I like, adding, I like adding names to people in the Bible because we lose sight of the fact that there are real people around Jesus. And so this is a story I'm going to say about a man named Josh. It's going to come out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 35. I see some people already fidgeting because you already know what I'm about to say. I'm going to ask that we please rise for the reading of the Gospel. We're going to be in Luke 18. Verse 35 through 43. As Jesus came to Jericho, a certain blind man, who I'm calling Josh, was sitting beside the road begging. When Josh heard the crowd passing by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus the Nazarene is passing by. Josh shouted, Jesus, son of David, show me mercy. Those leading the procession scolded him, telling him to be quiet. But Josh shouted even louder, Son of David, show me mercy. Jesus stopped and called for Josh to be brought to him. When he was present, Jesus asked, What do you want me to do for you? And Josh said, Lord, I want to see. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has healed you. At once he was able to see, and he began to follow Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they praised God too. You may be seated. I'm going to pray with you. 
God, we ask that you would add your blessing to this, the hearing and reading of your word. We ask now, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found holy, pleasing, and acceptable before you, our rock, and our redeemer. Pray all of this in your Son's holy and gracious name, Christ above. Amen. This is one of those stories that we may or may not know about. We know Jesus healed the blind several times, but this is one of those stories that kind of leaves some details out. And, and so I just kind of want to go over some of that. Like, we don't know much about who Josh is, and for the record, I don't know that's his name. Um, like, I'm kind of just making that part up, because like I said, I like having an actual name. It makes it a real person. But... I don't know, his name is Josh. We also don't know why he's living in Jericho, but we know he's living in and around Jericho. And that is the famous city from another Joshua story, where the walls came down. We know that Joshua is blind, and he is begging outside of the city on somewhat of a well-traveled road. And that's probably why he picked it, because he knew that he would have a lot of people going by that he could beg from. And he's used to a certain amount of noise and commotion. But something happens on this day. And Josh begins to hear a whole lot of commotion and a whole lot of noise that he's not used to. And then he begins to ask what's going on. And somebody tells him. Somebody tells Josh that Jesus the Nazarene is going by. And that gets Josh's attention. And Josh starts to shout. He starts to shout towards Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, show me mercy. It's kind of a weird thing to say. Like, if you saw me down the street, walking down the street on my way to Crosswalk, I don't think you would say, Hey, Brady, son of Glenn, could you pray for me? Like, that just, that's not how it goes for us normally. But there's a specific reason I think Josh is doing that. And we'll get to that. But as Josh is starting to identify Jesus as the son of David, the crowd starts to tell him to be quiet. They tell him to shut up. Stop making so much noise, calm down. And Josh gets louder. He says, Son of David, show me mercy. And I wonder how freaked out Josh was at what happens next. Like, we kind of lose sight of this because I can see and you can see and, and we don't think about what it's like to be blind, but Josh suddenly gets picked up by two or three guys. And they're carrying him somewhere. He doesn't know where, he can't see where they're going. He just knows he's going somewhere. This is the same crowd that was telling him to be quiet, so he's probably getting moved away from the crowd until somebody tells him that Jesus wants to see him. And suddenly, Josh is face to face with God incarnate. He is in the presence of Christ Almighty. And he has an audience with God himself. Pause and let that one settle in for a little bit. Josh, the blind beggar, got loud and obnoxious and called out to God himself and was granted an audience. Josh called out to God in the flesh for mercy, and now he is an arm's length away from the creator of heaven and earth. And God looks him in the eye and says, what do you want me to do for you? This is like cleaning out your attic, polishing up a lamp, and having a genie pop out, isn't it? Like, this is perfect. Out of everything that Josh could ask for, think about all that lays before him, all the opportunities there. And he answers him in one of the most simple ways. Lord, I want to see. So what was it about Josh's story that separates him from so many others who wanted Christ to heal them. What can we learn for ourselves about Josh and how to gain our vision back? How do we start to see with God's eyes into our life? Now you may not know this about me. I was born in Florida. I haven't shared that because it hasn't really mattered. I grew up in Ohio from the time I was two until I left for college. And so I claim to be in Ohio or, or Kentucky, depending on basketball season. It's going to be a good season for us this year. But I claim to be an Ohio because as far as I remember, I've always lived in Ohio. But I was born in Florida. We moved here when my dad graduated with his PhD. I don't remember a darn thing from living down there. So I'm in Ohio. 
Jesus is walking down the street, and he is identified as the Nazarene. And I don't think the guy introducing Jesus to Josh was trying to be slighting or, or demeaning or, or take away from who Jesus was. I think he was trying to identify Jesus for who he truly was. I think he was just trying to say, this is the Jesus from Nazareth that people have been talking about. But you might remember some other stories where people like the Pharisees or even one of Jesus' own disciples, Philip, questioned whether or not anything good could come from Nazareth. The Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem, the city of David, not Nazareth. This couldn't possibly be the Christ that we're all talking about. And so Jesus is identified as the Nazarene, and Josh knew better. Josh knew that Christ, the man walking in front of him, Jesus, was in fact the same man that Isaiah had talked about so long ago when he said that the Savior would come from Jesse's root, the family of David. So when Josh is saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, he is identifying Jesus not just as some miracle worker, not just as some teacher, he is identifying Jesus as the Christ. He is identifying Jesus for who he truly is, the Lord of creation, the great I am, the Messiah of the world. If you want to see God's vision for your life, you need to understand who God was when he was living among us. We cannot live into what God has for us in this life until we understand who God was when he lived among us. One of the things that will get in the way is trying to keep track of the details. We will get so worried about the who, the what, the where, the why, the how, the when. We get so worried about all that stuff. And details are important for plans, but when we're talking about God's vision, it's out of our control anyway. The details are not up to us, and so we can get so worried about how those things go that we lose sight of the very one that we are standing in front of, the very one that we are talking to. We lose sight of whose plan it truly is. We worry about who did what to us. We worry about what we've done to others. And so we begin to get bogged down by the details of our life. We'll say, if you are the one who screwed up, if you're the one who's messed up in your life, and, you know, there are only a few of us who've made mistakes, I wonder, if you're somebody who's messed up in your life, you can begin to look over God's plan for your life, God's intervening in your life, God's presence in your life, and you can say, that's fine. I, I can't live into what you have for me, God, until, until I get it all sorted out. Until I make amends for the mistakes I've made. Until, until I clean up my own mess. I cannot <clears throat> move into your plan until I earn your forgiveness, God. I cannot possibly live into your vision for me. Or maybe we assume that because we messed up, God doesn't have a plan for us anymore. Maybe we assume that because we screwed up, God's vision is gone, and it's no longer there for us. Or, or maybe somebody did something to us. Maybe we had that ideal. Maybe we were dreaming uh, when we were a kid about getting married and having that, that stereotypical American family of 2.5 kids, a dog, a cat, a white picket fence, and, and living comfortably in the suburbs. Maybe we had everything that we ever wanted. We were living the dream until they left, until the divorce happened, until we got fired from that job too soon, until we got sick too early, until something happened, until somebody hurt us, took something from us, until somebody did something to us. And then we begin to say, it's not my fault. You'll notice something. Josh doesn't care about how he got blind. We don't know if Josh gradually became blind, if he hurt himself in an injury, if somebody else hurt him in an injury. We don't know why or how Josh was blind. Born that way, sudden accident, doesn't matter. He goes before Christ and he doesn't say, I didn't do this, it's not my fault. Heal me of this. And he doesn't go before, go, go, he doesn't go before Christ 
and say, forgive me of the sins that I've committed and therefore heal me from this. He understands something. He understands the point is not how or why he became blind. The point is the source of vision. The point is Christ himself. Josh could have said, forgive me for my sins that I might see. Instead, he says, son of David, show me mercy. Lord, I want to see. He identifies Christ as the Lord of all, and he doesn't worry about the details. He doesn't worry about how he's going to see. He doesn't worry about when he's going to see. He doesn't worry why he couldn't see. He just says, Lord, I want to see. We can get so bogged down as to why we're not living into God's vision for our life that we lose sight of the vision itself. The point is not what causes our blindness. The point is the source of our vision. The longer we worry about why we are not living into God's vision for our life, the more we miss the point. The more we worry about shoring up all of the details of our life to make sure that we do live finally into God's plan for our life, the less we live into it. As odd as that might sound, at a certain point, we just need to acknowledge that it is God's vision for our life and not our own vision for our life. And we need to be willing to step into that, to ask for it, and to live into that. Because after all, Christ didn't come and say, some of us will get abundant life. He didn't say, I have come to give abundant life, but only to people who haven't screwed up, only to people who haven't had bad things happen to them. I came to give life, but only, you know, to nice people, to people I like, to good people. There aren't clauses. There aren't asterisks. There aren't exceptions. Christ came to give us access to this abundant life that God had for us from the very beginning. Everyone is meant to live the way God created us to so long ago back in the garden. And we're not talking about some distant day when you and I die and wake up on that distant happy shore in the presence of God. We're talking about now. This afternoon, now. When we leave here, now, we are meant to live that abundant life. But we can become so spiritually nearsighted, we lose sight of the fact that God has a plan for us for all eternity that starts now. And that's why it's so easy for us to disqualify ourselves from these plans, isn't it? We can't see how God is going to do it, so we say it's not for us. It's for somebody else. It's for those super spiritual people. I mean, we've heard that we were supposed to go out into the world, baptize, and make disciples, but I don't know what that means. I don't know what baptism is. I don't know how to make disciples. I don't know where to go. I, I don't know these things, so I can't. Or I don't have time. I don't have time to learn about baptism. I don't have time to learn what it means to make a disciple. I don't have time to learn how to make disciples. I don't have time to go anywhere else. i got too many other things going on here. We'll say it's the pastor's job. We'll say I've messed up too much. We'll say anything to disqualify ourselves because we do not see how God will do it in our own lives. We do not understand. We do not see how God is working all things together in our life for this. And after long enough, that blurriness, that fuzzy vision can blind us even to the basics. Things like loving God, loving others, and making disciples. The things that all of us have been commanded to do. When we talk about trying to find God's plan and God's will for our life, it boils down to six words. Love God, love others, and make disciples. There is a nuance to it. There's a specific way for you and I to do that that makes us come alive, that makes us live that abundant life. But all of it flows from loving God, loving others, and making disciples. And this is why it's so critical to understand the person we are speaking to when we ask to restore our vision. We are calling on God incarnate, God in the flesh, the Alpha and Omega, who has come to set us free and live the life that you and I were meant to live from the very beginning. And that may mean that God sets us free from things that we would not rather be free from. Things that we are comfortable with, things that we are content with, things that we really like. It might mean that our dreams look a little bit different on the other side. 
But that's because it's not about our vision. It's about God's vision for our lives. Amen. We pray with you. God, we come before you now thankful that you do have a plan and a vision for our life. Thankful that you do want us to live into that and to live abundantly. God, we pray. We pray that we would be willing to see that. That we would be willing to live into that. That we would be willing to take one step into the dark and trust that you will guide our steps from there. Father, we thank you that you sent your Son into our lives, that he may open up our eyes and our hearts to all that you have for us. We pray all of these things in your Son's holy and gracious name, Christ above. Amen.